Like the, the for lesson, this class? Yeah, the lesson before you showed up, like, it was kind of like a history of like, the War of Independence and stuff like that. Oh, I And when that. Israel changed hands between all the, um, oh, there's the blue screen on the dot. Perfect. Yeah, I got it on today. Where's the, oh, there's the I, you guys talked oh. about the dots so much. There <laughs> it is. What is this? These are being recorded. The, set, the whole the whole session is being recorded. Okay. Oh, it's weird too. Look at that. Whatever you say will be will be recorded. <laughs> so forever. Be careful. Are they putting them up online after this whole thing's over, or what is the? No idea. Saving it for future generations. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, yeah. Some lecturers request their sessions be recorded, maybe they would for marketing purposes or something. Mm -hmm. so, yeah. Maybe he goes back and tries to improve. He would be that teacher. It's like, like, it's like when people are at the gym and they're like watching themselves work out. <laughs> to go back and watch <laughs> That's just helpful though. It is oh. helpful. <laughs> Are you the, are you the, <laughs> the bodybuilder? Thank you, Fenton. Like... <laughs> All right, see you later. Thank you, Fenton. See ya. Have a nice day. Yeah, have a nice day. We'll see, see you soon. See you in like an two. hour. <laughs> <laughs> Bye. I can see it. <laughs> You're the bodybuilder. You don't see it? <laughs> Getting swole. <laughs> Record it. It's Record. Still... <laughs> That's my very goal, my bad. I'm still proud of them. I know they're getting <laughs> I've like shrunk, like all together shrunk. I don't know about you, but when school hap like happens, I do nothing. Yeah. Life yeah. gets really unbalanced. <laughs> Yo, yeah. Uh, I've lost all my couch lifting muscles. I do. lost all of my nine to five yoga muscles. <laughs> what am I going to do with myself? <laughs> are you a yoga instructor? Yeah. Oh my gosh, of course you are. <laughs> Masseuse, yoga instructor. <laughs> well, <A> traveler. <laughs> I, I don't know if I can call myself a yoga instructor. You should start doing yeah, yoga I know, I know. I will. I'm thinking I want to do them on Thursdays. We should, we should have like a group do yoga. Well, that's the, that's, the plan. The plan is that I want to teach yoga classes to NYU students for a pound or for free. <laughs> Probably for free because, <laughs> let's be honest, do I have a pound to pay for yoga? <laughs> no. <laughs> I thought people would pay that though. No. I think they would. You probably have to start off free and then like cook them. It's all part of the marketing tactic. First class for you guys. Yeah. And from there, you just have to be so awesome. But. I mean, if you would like free or one pound or pastries, I'm sure people would laugh at the pastries and then just give you a pound. Or give me nothing. Yeah, but I don't know. I feel like, I feel like people understand, you know? Yeah. Everyone's scratching. It's true. I also that gin is just like the worst. It smells like cheese. Did you guys pay the money? No. No. Back no, door. Yeah. yeah, that's what I tried doing, but then it locked me out one time. Yeah. It's... I was so angry that I just ran three miles. <laughs> it was like 11.30 at night. I was so stupid. <laughs> no, I tried to pay once. And then they're like, oh, we don't take cash. So I went upstairs and the back door was open and I was like, okay, the back door loves me more. <laughs> they so. don't take cash? Well, I freak <laughs> it. <laughs> the freak. I feel like you just knock, but would also let you in. Yeah. I feel like everyone's kind of like sneaking in too. There's gotta be someone paying. Oh, I'm sure there is, but I've never seen yeah. anyone. Yeah. Um, side note, <clears throat> I'm confused. I tried to match up our like our schedule with a calendar and it doesn't work. No, um Okay, so session we're in session four right now. Okay. Which is this okay. one here. Because we haven't done this yet. And then session five is in three weeks from now. 
Yeah, so it would be October 22nd. Uh-huh. And then there's probably, I think there's another holiday. There might be. I think there's a... Not for the 29th, I sure hope so. What's the 29th? Why, what's the 29th? I just have a lot going on that week. Uh, oh, okay. <laughs> I thought it was a holiday. Yeah. <laughs> no, but it's right before we leave for a break and it's really great to know. <laughs> Actually, oh no. I'm getting Arabic in this class confused because they're both in The problem is, okay, so if this is the next class, so then that would be five, then this would be six, right? Oh, no, 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 five would be, wait, so four, and then one, two, three, that would be five, then six, then seven, we, he knows we're on break, right? Yes, he okay. does. But I think he's. Yeah. You can ask. But anyways, Hi, it doesn't hello. line up because at this point. Hello. Hello. Like essentially, if you do this, it ends straight. Right here. Yeah. Can you guys hear us? Yes. yes. Okay. As as usual, or is it not as good? No, it's fine. It's good. Okay, we great. even got the rhythm. Hi guys, how are you doing? Good, good. how are you? Good. Shana Tzava, Happy New Year. You know there was Happy a Jewish holiday last week. Did so, you celebrate? Uh, uh, we just went out for dinner with some friends in, in Berlin actually. Uh, oh. How would you guys? <laughs> Any of you did anything for the holiday? Uh, Get invited or something? Work. <laughs> I did a lot of schoolwork. <laughs> we have our next meeting. We have uh, more holidays coming up. Okay, there are two periods in Israel where there is like a battery of holidays. One in the spring, one in the fall. We're now in the fall battery of holidays, which is going to continue till about mid-October. So we only have one session today, then we're off for two weeks. You're aware of that, right? Yeah. I think our session is only to check my calendar on the 22nd of October. Is that correct? Yeah. yeah. Great. Um, okay, I think what we need to do today is uh, rerun what we did last week, uh, both because it didn't record and because there was a relatively long break. And then we have another uh, slideshow coming up, a new slideshow. And next session, which is on the 22nd of October, Francesca is going to do the first reading presentation, correct? Yes. Oh, okay, great. Okay, so let's see. Did you see my email? I did, I did. I couldn't look at it though yet. I will. Um, okay. Uh, let's see if I can if I can share with you the uh, the slideshow. Share content. Okay. I have a quick question. Yes, please. Um, are there any other holidays like in November? No, no. I think you yeah. have one okay. week of fall break, but uh, Jewish holidays finish in, in mid-October, and then there's only um, Hanukkah, and I don't think really it's, it counts as a holiday, so I think we still teach Hanukkah. Ugh, what? So far, just play. It's a work out. Trying to put the slideshow on, but it doesn't seem to work. Difficult, difficult, share application doesn't work. Ah, no. Can you see it? Mm, no. No? Uh, so it kind of doesn't work. Oh, wait, here it's coming. There we go. Okay, so we'll redo the slideshow, but this time you will tell me what you see as much as you remember. Okay, so we're starting with the campus tour. Remember, we have a focus on the campus now and also uh, the readings on the campus are supposed to be some sort of paradigm or template. Um, 
So let's get started. What do we see here? Uh, we see an old Arab house that's being used as a synagogue for Iraqi Jews. Very good. Okay. What do they call themselves? The community. Down here is the name of the community on the lower left. I know it's, a, it's difficult with the Hebrew. Should I read it for you? Sure, please. It says Beit Knesset, meaning Beit Knesset. What is a Beit Knesset? A meeting house? Yeah. Yeah, That's literally it's a meeting house. And it's also the Hebrew word for... Synagogue? Jewish religious building. The word used in English is actually from Greek, a synagogue. Okay, Beit Knesset meeting house is actually the Hebrew name for a synagogue, any synagogue. And this specific synagogue is called Olei Bavel. What is Olei Bavel? Olei, it's like Aliyah. So Ascension. Yeah, Ascension. It has a lot of historical, traditional, religious meanings of Jews going to Jerusalem originally, but then also the entire Holy Land. It's considered to go up in a spiritual way to go to a higher level if you if you go here but um, it also has a Zionist meaning at this point which is um, immigration okay Immig uh, Jewish immigration to this country Ole Bavel what is Bavel it's a country yeah is it like Babylon that's right and Babylon today where is it located Iraq. Very good. Very good. And uh, the Greek name of Babylonia or Iraq? The land between uh, the two rivers? Mesopotamia? Mesopotamia. Yeah. Very good. Very good. So uh, this is a community from Mesopotamia, Iraq, Babylon. It's a very old community. It's probably the oldest diaspora community in the world. Okay, It's been almost completely uh, uh, displaced, expelled uh, after uh, or around uh, uh, the foundation of Israel. In the, Already during World War II, there were a lot of attacks on Jews in Iraq, uh, the so-called Farhud, and then uh, after Israel was founded, many of them came here as refugees, Jewish refugees or immigrants, or Lim. In, the, in traditional Jewish religious or Zionist terminology. So they founded this uh, synagogue in a former village. What do we know about the village? Um, it, they displaced, um, did they not displace people that were already there? Mm -hmm. um, Who? Who was Arab. there before? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Religion? Oh, uh, Islamic. Arab. Yeah, Muslim. Muslim. This was a solidly Muslim village, several several mosques. Not aware there were any, any Christians, but there could have been a few Christians. So a Muslim village, Palestinian village, a, what was it called? Uh, Sheikh Munis. Very good. Okay, Sheikh Munis. Sheikh is a community leader, so it was named after this community leader, there was a grave of that community leader there, so it's attested from at least the 18th century. From at least the 18th century, we know this village existed there. But let's go back to the synagogue. There's a couple of more details that are quite interesting here. First of all, what's the colors of the sign of the synagogue? They're blue and white, the colors of the Israeli flag. Very good, very good. And then we have some plants around uh, around the entry. What kind of plants are these? Banana. And olive tree. And olive. <laughs> Very good. <laughs> olive tree, banana. In the background, there's some date palms. Okay, so these are leftovers of the gardens. The village was actually very active in agriculture and uh, at a certain point also in building. Uh, some villagers would work as construction workers on, uh, in Tel Aviv building by houses. Uh, before we move on, one last detail, which is up here. Can you see it? I'm marking it with the uh, the arrow. There are three letters. It's an abbreviation. The two, like the inverted 
a, a comma up here, double comma, it's a, a quotation marks. It shows that it's an abbreviation. It's a B, S, and a D. Okay? Basad. Any idea what that could mean? These three letters up here on the sign. Have you ever seen anything like it? No. No? Okay, religious Jews will write a, um, it's almost like a little prayer uh, on everything they write, from shopping lists to uh, street sign, anything, okay? And uh, uh, it's an abbreviation, it comes in two forms, one in Hebrew or one in, Ara in Aramaic. This one is in Aramaic. It means Besada de Shmaya, with the help of God, okay, or with the help of the yeah, the help of God. In Hebrew, it's Beit B H, which means Bezrat Hashem. The meaning is the same. What is Aramaic? Uh, it's the old Semitic language of the Palestine and northern Lebanon and Syria mountains, where it was the language Jesus spoke. Wow. Yeah, in Christian tradition, it's, uh, it's Jesus' language. In Jewish tradition, it's the language of a very important uh, theological um, compilation, namely? The... It's not, not the Bible, Bible, but... The... the... Yeah. Is it the Talmud? Yeah. That's right. That's correct. Very good. Yeah, historically, it's a language that followed Hebrew and preceded Arabic. Okay, and linguists today believe that many people were not even aware that they were moving slowly from Hebrew into Aramaic and eventually into Arabic because the languages are quite closely related. It's still spoken today, by the way, by some Jews in Israel who originated in Kurdistan and also by Christians in Syria, okay, although it's unclear what the situation there is now. So, let's move on. Next picture. Okay, what do we see here? Parking lot. Mm hmm. Um, what are these bulldozers? The sort of slum like buildings? Are they um, tearing down the neighborhood to construct the university? Is that yeah, that's right. Yeah, that's correct. They, the last buildings are just being knocked down. The population, the Iraqi Jewish community there, is being compensated when their buildings are torn down and they're being uh, resettled somewhere else. But uh, some of them refuse. Okay? They actually like their place and they want to stay. So um, including the synagogue, uh, uh, the university and city hall want to knock down everything, but the community to some degree resists and there are pending uh, court orders. Okay? And there are these bulldozers going around. We see it down here. Bulldozers sort of going around sort of perhaps harassing the local population into agreeing to leave. Okay. I think we have mentioned who is, uh, who is uh, um, working on these bulldozers or driving these bulldozers. Muslim Arabs, right? Yeah, that was my impression when I was there personally. You know, it, maybe it's not consistent, but when I was there, there were uh, Muslim Arab construction workers. Remember, in Israel, where there is a bit of a case society, construction work today is largely in either an Arab Muslim or Arab job, or uh, newly also Chinese, Chinese uh, migrant workers. Okay, um, yeah, we should mention that um, the university has recently built a, um, a new dorm on, on top of the Muslim cemetery, and there was a court uh, ruling that allowed for that. Okay, there was very little resistance on part of some students, but uh, uh, basically, the, the Muslim cemetery has, been, cemetery has been built over, and this is not unique. We see actually universities being built on cemeteries in quite a lot of places, usually after the community has been either expelled or, or genocided. For example, in Greece and Thessaloniki, the university is built on a Jewish cemetery. So in the U.S., sometimes we see universities built on former Native American sites. It's, it's unfortunately a widespread phenomenon. What do we see here? Uh, which photo? Uh, okay, three of them. 
Uh, on the left, oh, okay. there is a building with this construction style. What would you call it, or what does it remind you of? Orientalist. Yeah. Okay. And how would you define Orientalism? Um, like a Western appropriation of like Middle Eastern and Far Eastern architecture. Mm hmm. Very so good. Building styles. Okay. Uh, who is uh, the author uh, most associated with Orientalism? Is it Edward Said? Very good, very good. And just to, uh, we, we may see a short movie on him and we may talk about it more, but what is the number one critique uh, that uh, may be brought against uh, Edward Said? That he's kind of an Orientalist himself? Perhaps, perhaps, and that also uh, much of the material he developed had already been developed by local research in the Middle East who simply didn't have the same access to Western, uh, Western uh, academia, uh, specifically from Lebanon, if I'm not mistaken. Okay. So in some way he's more of a conduit of these ideas than the, um, than the original uh, developer of these ideas. In any case, uh, his role obviously is very important in the academia. Uh, so, uh, on the right we have another building. It's actually the oldest purpose-built uh, lecture hall on campus. Uh, when the university was uh, founded and bundled, there were some preceding colleges. Uh, the university used some of the Arab houses for lecture halls, or formerly Arab houses. And then uh, it started building its own lecture halls. This was called the Red Building because of the bricks. It eventually became part of the law faculty. It's today named after? Um, Joseph Buffman. Very good. And what do we know about Joseph Buffman? He was um, the linchpin between prostitutes and government officials in... Frankfurt. Nice. That's correct, thank you. Uh, he's um, a Holocaust survivor from Poland, a, I think a child or youth Holocaust survivor who wound up in a DP camp in West Germany and started a, uh, a brothel empire. Okay. And then later City Hall in Frankfurt was corrupt and he became sort of a linchpin between these two uh, worlds. The legal, political world and then the, the world of prostitution and in many cases, if we are realistic about prostitution, a rape. Okay, so um, what do you think about uh, taking money from people with this kind of background who made their money in this kind of way for university donations? Um, <laughs> I mean, it's the idea is um, what what kind of organization are you trying to run and what I guess, what is your goal? Is it making money or is it um, fostering an atmosphere throughout that holds to the integrity of the kind of education and world that you want <laughs> to run? Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. More? It's about, I mean, how, how much you want to stick to your mission. I mean, if you want to run a law school and uphold the rule of law, you should probably double check if the people funding it have usurped the very principles you're trying to propagate. Yeah, it's very unlikely that this was not known because uh, Buchmann is a very well-known figure. So apparently, at one point, people made a uh, sort of a you know a real politic decision that money doesn't stink. But uh, remember, a university isn't just a business. It's not just about money and the image of the university and the, uh, the sort of values it transmits uh, at the end of the day are also a long-term investment. So if that is abandoned, uh, you know, the university may do well on a short run, but in the long run it probably endangers its reputation. Uh, and this, in this way, the universities are different from other businesses. Other businesses don't necessarily care. You know, they think short-term, but a university is usually a long-term affair that spans many generations. 
So uh, below is the, the plaza uh, of donors with a lot of names. There's a biblical quotation here. Okay, I think it's uh, from the Hebrew Bible, so it sort of addresses both Christians and uh, Jews. I think it's in Hebrew and English, no Arabic. Now, if, if you look at these uh, names of donors, you will find that they're from all over the world except from the surrounding countries of Israel. Why? Protest, kind of, um, to the existence yeah. of Israel. Yeah. What else? Um, they don't have very many students from the surrounding areas, do they? Well, there are Arab Israeli students, quite a few, but not from neighboring countries. Uh, there are sometimes no diplomatic relations or very tense relations. It's very difficult to get to it. Permits even as a tourist from an Arab country. Yeah, you know, obviously it reflects the uh, the sort of the isolation of Israel inside the Middle East. Okay. So uh, it's easier to get donations from Australia than from a, a neighboring country. You know, like uh, let's say um, uh, some of the Gulf states who usually give quite generously, and even to Israel, but not specifically to this university. Okay, uh, when I say Israel, I mean, uh, for example, the stadium in Sakhnin, a soccer stadium in an Arab-Israeli town, was donated by Qatar, if I'm not mistaken. So it's not very consistent. It's not that they never give, but they don't give here. Okay. So uh, here we have a synagogue. What do we know about the synagogue? Another synagogue, the, I should say. It's the, second synagogue. the materials were taken from all over the world to build it, and it's supposed to be um, like a secular light, uh, lecture hall where people can come and listen to intellectual talks um, and also spiritual talks from the synagogue. Um, the synagogue caters to a very orthodox population, uh, orthodox Jewish population, um, with the women being separated behind the, the little screen there. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, it's also supposed, the architecture is supposed to reflect a Torah scroll. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But yeah, at the same the time, kind of ends up representing a, a cleavage between the academic and the religious world instead of a union. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I think one of you pointed out that actually the shared area, namely the lobby, is extremely small. Uh, I'll read for you the, uh, the mission statement that the Swiss architect Mario Bocci received by the, the donors. Uh, a play, and this is a quote, a place for prayer and a place for discussion, a synagogue and lecture hall, a place where the religious and the secular can meet. This was the mandate which I received from Pauletta Norberto Symbolista when they commissioned me. Is it really a place where religious and secular meet? And what kind of religion is secular? Well, it's not really, um, it doesn't really cater to um, any religion outside of Judaism and even outside of Orthodox Judaism. I think you mentioned last time that. Um, there's no place for ablution for the um, for Muslims who come that they have to wash their hands and feet in the bathroom sinks. Mm-hmm. And yeah, then also the, fa the fact that they in the synagogue women are separated from men kind of shows that there's really not that much effort taken to bringing everyone together. If women have to like poke holes through the wall to see what's going on, they're not really involved in the discussion. Very good. Okay, very good. Uh, just to fill in a few details, the, uh, the stones are actually brought from the Alps in Europe, uh, the outer stones, the inner stones from Tuscany and Italy, and the, 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 the semi-precious stone behind the tourist shrine, apparently from Pakistan, was then cut in Belgium and shipped 
to uh, this country. It's by square footage the most expensive building uh, on campus, perhaps in Israel. Okay. Now, uh, also, uh, I think we should make some connection between the synagogue we saw at the beginning of the slideshow and this synagogue. What's the difference between these two synagogues? The type of funding, yeah, and then also the type of Judaism represented. One is an Ashkenazi synagogue and the other is a Mizrahi synagogue? Yeah, I think the first is Mizrahi synagogue. This one looks like Ashkenazi style, okay? And then obviously, one, this synagogue was built only a few years ago, 1997 to 1998. And it's supposed to be the representative synagogue of campus, but the preceding synagogue, named the Mizrahi synagogue, is supposed to be knocked down. Okay, so in some way, this synagogue is supposed to replace the Mizrahi synagogue. A new synagogue is supposed to replace a historical synagogue, an Ashkenazi synagogue, a Mizrahi synagogue. So um, it's a, in some way, it says a lot about how Israeli society uh, is ranked. In front of the synagogue, there is a, a memorial for uh, soldiers uh, among the faculty and students who died in Israel's wars. It's called Lezecher Chaleleinu B'Marachot Israel, to the uh, memory of our fallen or dead in the uh, fights or struggles of Israel. Uh, obviously, we already see the first person plural, the we. Okay, so not everybody on campus may be able to identify with that, um, especially those not in the army, especially those not Jewish. And then there is a long list of names here, but even more room left. That room is obviously for future victims of these struggles. Uh, on the same square, this is sort of the central square where the synagogue and the memorial is located, there's also the central library. It's supposed to look like an opened up book. Okay, think of these old books with like a hard binding when you open it up, that's more or less what it's supposed to look like. And then the Diaspora Museum. Diaspora Museum is not really a museum. Okay, a museum would be defined as a place where historical artifacts are kept. Here they are mainly copies. It's more of an edutainment center. Do we know what happened to this over the last years? Um, I'm going to just guess, but um, as you're saying, it's become more of entertainment, but I think, does it have anything to do with um, kind of those controversial figures that have a lot of money um, are entertaining there? That's correct. It's a, actually a Russian gentleman who uh, have invested into this and uh, a, a, it appears that some of them have ties to so-called oligarchs, maybe to so-called Russian mafia. Uh, there may be some uh, some police investigations running. So it's a it's a way of whitewashing one's name, maybe, but um, it's not necessarily uh, very good for the academic profile. So uh, we have some. Um, we have some uh, uh, examples, samples here of signs of the. Um, public science on the uh, university campus. What languages are used here and is it consistent or not? Hebrew, Arabic, there's some like transliterations into Latin characters, um, pictures, but it's not consistent. Yeah. <laughs> not consistent. Yeah, we have Hebrew, Arabic, English, it's not very consistent. There are some pictograms, if you like, you can consider it like a language, and it's not really consistent. Now, uh, we have some interesting uh, examples on the left. There is one sign that is in Hebrew only. Any uh, idea what it could be? Bor bitachon? The, it's, it's the cement pit where you can mm -hmm. throw suspicious objects. And the assumption there is that only someone who understands Hebrew will be likely to throw a suspicious object into the pit and not someone who speaks, say, Arabic. Or Correct. English. Why is there no English? Because they don't want to scare tourists. 
It's possible, possible. Very good. Okay, and then down here there's a donor plaque where a donor's name is mentioned for some piece of public art. It's in English only. Why? Um, because those are the people that speak English are often the people that either donate or care to see a plaque. <laughs> That's right. It's probably uh, mainly for the donor, her or himself. Okay. Um, Here, and this is I think the last slide of the campus um, slideshow, we have a on the big picture, the, the Jewish Studies building in the background, uh, there's some public art over here and a, a, a figure of a, a man sitting on a bench playing chess. Any idea who this could be? In Poland, right? Yeah. He, he, oh, he uh, housed, um, he housed uh, Jewish like refugees in his home during World War II, didn't he? Not exactly, but Poland was right and it connected to Jews, yeah, and to the Holocaust, yeah. It's part of an initiative in Poland. I think you said there was also one in somewhere in the U.S. Um, this one, New York. This one, I think, in yeah. Georgetown. And it's somewhat of a commemoration of like, tr I don't know, I, from what I remember, it was somewhat of trying to put a positive light to Poland in, in the World War, even though, um, kind of like damage control for the very country. Good, very good. Yeah, there is actually a, a fierce debate going on between Poland and uh, Israel or the, the Jewish lobby, if you like, about the degree of Polish collaboration versus resistance. To frame this a little more broadly, this is a question that comes up in almost every European country. To what degree European Christians collaborated with Nazism and fascism and uh, the genocide of Jews and to what degree they resisted. And in every country you can probably find examples for both, but Poland was pretty much the peak, certainly of uh, uh, resistance and rescue, perhaps also of collaboration. The largest uh, European Jewish community was in Poland. About half of the Jews murdered in the Holocaust were from Poland. And Poland was at the same time one of the countries hardest hit by Nazism in terms of persecution of Christians as well. So uh, the guy we see here, he is Jan Karski. Uh, he was a Polish officer, Christian from a, a Jewish uh, social setting. I think the city of Lodz with a, a very strong Jewish community, maybe even majority. Sometimes these Christians who lived in a, in a Jewish environment were called white Jews, okay? Uh, note the racist undertones of this. So he was basically a Jewish friendly Christian and he became a part also of the resistance during uh, the Holocaust. He was smuggled into uh, camps in order to report for uh, the Polish resistance and to the Polish exile in London. And um, he did survive. Uh, and uh, he is considered a so-called righteous Gentile, he, a Christian who helped to save Jews during the Holocaust. The, the story of the chessboard is quite interesting for those of you into chess. Apparently there is a specific combination of chess figures that you can arrive at in a game. This combination is from a, the 19th century. If you, are, if you arrive at this point in the game, it looks like you're in the middle of the game, but the person sitting where Jankowski is sitting will necessarily win this game. Okay, so it's actually symbolic as well, sort of an optimistic take. It's connected to an anecdote that Jan Karski was playing a chess game with perhaps a fellow resistance fighter when uh, Nazis or collaborators stormed the house and he initially refused to flee before finishing the chess game. It's probably an anecdote. Okay. Supposed to underline his heroism. So, and it's obviously this is part of the of the Polish sort of a public relations drive. One of these figures is, by the way, put up in Kielce. Kielce being a town renowned for a post-Holocaust pogrom, okay? As if the Holocaust wasn't enough, after the Holocaust, some of the survivors were actually massacred by uh, their Christian neighbors after return home. And this was the case in Kielce in Poland. So putting up a statue there is certainly an apologetic attempt. Questions? Um, I just, I guess I don't have a question kind of just 
interesting that I've noticed, wondering what you think of it. Um, it seems like there's a lot of international influence um, in terms of like architecture and, um, or I mean, just a lot of these buildings and um, commemorations. And I'm just interested, um, I guess, what do you feel that says about, there, it seems like there's a divide because within within the the sanctions of like what sorry i'm not explaining very well um like the signs are in english arabic and hebrew as if they need to speak to people of those three languages within the culture yet there's a lot of this outside um influence in terms of architecture to bring people together and i'm wondering if this this international presence of like pressure to get people to get along, um, whether through this idea of, of the, the scroll building that doesn't really function well, or, um, or through like Poland's kind of commemoration. Um, does it seem, does it feel like while you're there that there's a lot of pressure internationally to get along that kind of is like a botched job? Sorry. <laughs> yeah, I think there is a, there's some truth to that. Uh, remember the, uh, that Judaism during its diaspora phase, which to some degree continues today, was very international. So Israel cannot help but being very international. At the same time, I think there is also a, a certain compensation for the isolation of Israel in the region uh, by stressing international uh, ties outside the region. So if you can't be friends with your neighbors, at least be friends with you know people far away. And the third point would obviously be that this country is also the holy land traditionally for Christians, Muslims and Jews. So many people from outside this country take an interest in this country for religious reasons, sometimes even secularized Christians or Muslims may take an interest in this country for uh, cultural, traditional, historical reasons. So, in some way, Israel is a very, very international country. At the same time, it can feel very parochial, okay? especially uh, these days when uh, we see such a strong rise of ultra-right-wing nationalism and exclusion of anybody, uh, not Jewish, not Ashkenazi, not of Jewish origin. So, it's... Um, there is a tension between the sort of the universalist aspect of this country and a very sort of tribal and and introverted aspect. Does that help? Yeah, yeah. Thank you. So, <laughs> thank you. Yeah, and you can see both. You can see both attested to in this country. You know, I, I think in language we can see often that Hebrew is clearly preferred. Sometimes we see this Hebrew only approach. You know, where things will be only labeled in Hebrew or or Dafka, you know, in spite of everything, although many of the customers may not understand, products may only be labeled in Hebrew to show, you know, like the nationalist uh, tendencies. Uh, but at the same time, many, many products, places will be extremely multilingual. So, and we'll see this tension more often, uh, even historically, between uh, multilingualism, monolingualism, in uh, a global society and a parochial society. Uh, did we talk about the uh, the village? Uh, I think we did about the greenhouse, right? I think we mentioned it. It's the last house of the village that's supposed to be preserved of um, Sheikh Muniz. It used to belong to Ibra Ibrahim Abu Kakhil, who was the village elder. And um, he had an agreement with the Haganah, with the, uh, the left-wing Jewish militia, that uh, the Muslims of Sheikh Muniz, where the university is now located, would stay and would become Israeli citizens. Something went wrong, a right-wing militia group allegedly, according to one version, spread rumors that there would be a massacre, and this prompted the villagers to leave. Today they live in a diaspora of the, by themselves uh, that stretches around many countries, in, all the way to New Zealand, apparently. And I think we have talked about ways to sort of um, try and make up, sort of try and uh, create some sort of conciliation uh, for the university. And 
again, it's a question that comes up not only here at Tel Aviv University, but in many places around the world. And you had some interesting ideas. Can you remind me of them, please? I said that um, Tel Aviv University should teach a class about the history of its location to kind mm -hmm. of That's a great idea. Itself the past. And um, <clears throat> perhaps they could offer free uh, scholarships, substantial scholarships, to the descendants of the population that was displaced. Very good. Any more ideas? Um, I also think. Um, it would be interesting if there was a collaboration between um, the Iraqi Jews, um, the Muslims that lived before there before that, as well as the academics, um, in a cooperation to build some some type of memorial um, or some some type of project, whether at that museum, <laughs> controversial museum or um, as a permanent structure. Excellent, excellent. It would be interesting to have a triangular co collaboration, cooperation between the former villagers and uh, the, the Iraqi Jewish refugees and academics. At this point, the university is basically in denial about it and is banning any public memorialization of the history of the university. Uh, which in some degrees obviously, uh, to some degree obviously undermines the very mission of the university, which is inquiry and, and research. Do you know why they've, they've banned that, have they said? Why they banned it? Yeah. I think it's considered politically uh, dangerous. Uh, uh, at this point in this country, uh, there is a tendency towards erasing the history of this country uh, before uh, 1948 at least, and anything that's a reminder of a non-Jewish presence, of interreligious relations, of uh, historical uh, structures that precede Zionism is, um, is considered almost a taboo, and increasingly so. Uh, we see that, for example, also in, uh, in the education system. Uh, apparently all the history books were exchanged recently for history books that were sort of whitewash of anything that didn't fit uh, the current ideology. So there is actually, yeah, <laughs> there is actually a tendency now to sort of uh, rewrite history in a, in a very streamlined ideological manner. And as a historian, obviously, uh, for me, that's, um, uh, that's a problem because uh, not only are we sometimes pressured to also reflect that in our teaching, but also uh, History isn't a supermarket where you can just choose what you like. Okay? History always has things that happen to fit our interests, but also things that don't fit our interests. And we can't just choose and pick uh, the cherries and then discard the rest. Well, truth always surfaces, right? In the history, I mean, the history will surface even if, I feel like, if not, if it's silenced, it will just resurface in in a different way. Yes, you're right. In I believe you're right. Yeah, I, also, you know, you cannot uh, uh, lie to everybody all the time, so at one point probably this bubble will uh, burst and people will realize that what they have been taught as the history of this country wasn't the history of this country at all, but actually uh, an ideological um, sort of a system uh, that pretended to be history. Okay. And we are trying to do something broader here, and that is also reflected in the readings. We had five readings on the campus, uh, history. Uh, one was uh, from an architectural ma magazine called Dokomomo, and a special issue on the history of Tel Aviv. They call it the history of Tel Aviv. I would call it the history of Tel Aviv Jaffa. So uh, one of the articles was on shaping a modernist university campus on Tel Aviv University by Diana Dolev. We had another reading called Palestine Remembered, Welcome to Sheikh Muniz by a probably Palestinian group on the internet with a lot of visual material, pictures mainly, black and white pictures, historical pictures of the village. A Rappaport's a article, History Erased from Haaretz, uh, an Israeli uh, newspaper, he 
sort of gives a broader context about the preservation and destruction of historical sites in this country since 1948. Then uh, Tel Aviv University's official history from their web page called TAU History, the Making of University, and finally an Israeli NGO called Zohot, which means women, re female, or remember, and they have a register of all villages and towns and cities that were destroyed in or after 1948 in this country, and they have also a, um, a section on Sheikh Muniz. Uh, what do you think about these readings? How are they connected? What languages are used? And can we put them on some sort of spectrum, linguistic and political spectrum, please? Yeah, it's interesting how the readings will be about the same subject, but yet not. They'll both mention complete. They both mention things that are completely absent in the other. So on one hand, like the Tel Aviv University um, write-up won't mention Sheikh Muniz at all, or even it's like it seems like it was just built on like unfounded land versus the Palestine Remembered one, which only focused on the fact that there was a village there beforehand. Mm-hmm. Yeah. What languages are used in these five sources? Let's start with uh, the architectural source. That was English, right? Yeah, I think there was a sprinkling of French as well. Palestine Remembered. Arabic, right? Arabic and English. Arabic and English. The Haaretz article. The Hebrew and English. Correct. A making of university, the university website. English, English and yeah. Hebrew. Yeah. Okay, and then the Hort, the NGO. All three. That yeah, that one. Yeah. Hmm. Isn't. That all three, all three, yeah, English, Hebrew, Arabic, yeah. Now, if we order them in some sort of imaginary political linguistic spectrum, which one would be the most sort of uh, uh, maybe a conformist one? Tel Aviv, History of Tel Aviv. Yeah, the university official website, then less conformist. The architecture yeah, one. Yeah, architecture. Probably the architecture one. Then? Um, Haaretz article. Haaretz article would be pretty much uh, at the center. Okay, then? Uh, so yeah, the Zohar one. The Zohar, the NGO, okay, just left yeah. at the center, and then on the very the left was the Palestinian side, like the Palestine, Palestine remembered. And this is what we're trying to do. I think bias is probably built into human thought, into human societies. And there are a few ways to mitigate that. One of them is variety. So we're trying to offer you a variety of approaches. Okay, it's an antidote to sort of ideological streamlining of any kind. So uh, ideally, the readings will cover a very wide spectrum throughout this, uh, this course. And uh, I think, as people doing research, it's very important to be open to all kinds of sources and not to uh, pick our sources in advance so that we actually only get one side of the story, no matter which one. I have a question, sorry. Yes. Um, we, so for me personally, I can only read um, the issues in English. Like, I can only read what I, in what's, published in English, but in Arabic or in Hebrew, um, is there any translations that are a lot more biased, or is there anything in terms of that that we don't get to see as well, if we don't understand? Yes, obviously your, uh, your reach, your intellectual reach is very much limited by the knowledge of language, and mine too, okay? I have a little Arabic, but not very much, my Hebrew is okay. But for example, I don't have Turkish. And if you really want to delve into the history of the city, you would also need to have Turkish. There's some German sources which I could probably read, but remember, language is the first and primary filter. 
For example, a lot of Hebrew speakers will never see the Arabic story, uh, which has been published largely in Arabic on the city, and vice versa, many Arabic speakers outside this country who don't know Hebrew will probably have limited access to the Hebrew version of the story. In some way, English is a useful language, though, because usually people try to translate a little of their of their story into English for international audience. So you're comparably lucky that you know English, and uh, you have you have limited but uh, but reasonable access to to the discourse. And I think also uh, some of you know a little Arabic, right? Yeah. Maybe a touch. But as well. I mean, yeah, but it's, we're not reading the newspaper. Yeah. <laughs> well, we did. We did. The, oh, you're right. We did. We totally the did. The conversation we have so right cool. now is very important because it, it. I think, you know, if we can't read the sources, let's at least be aware of the existence of those sources. Okay. I think the moment we are aware of the existence of those sources, we are already half the way there. Many people are not even aware of the existence of sources and languages they don't speak. That's also, by the way, where we do linguistic landscaping. Even if you can't identify or read exactly what is written somewhere in Hebrew or Arabic, at least you need to know it's there. Questions? Okay, so we'll continue now with the next slideshow and entering new material. Let's see if we can make this work. This is share content.